free theological and profoundly insightful source, a t-shirt that my daughter bought me in the north end of Boston, the Italian section, says, forget about it. Forget about it. And um, we started with this, forget about religion. It's not about religion, it's about having a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Forget about rugged independence. Where do we get the idea that we're supposed to go it alone, that we have to do everything ourselves? We were created to be in fellowship with one another, to be interde interdependent upon one another as the body of Christ. <clears throat> Forget about the past. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has passed away, gone, ceased, it's dead. The new has come. And so we are not tied to the past. We are not bound by the past. We are free to live fully in Christ. And then last, we talked about anger. Forget about it. The anger of human beings never brings about the righteous life that God desires, we discover. And now today, we're going to talk about you. Yes, we're going to talk about you, yourself. Numero uno, number one. The main enchilada. And I've got news for you. It's not about you. Even though the culture is saying it's all about you, it's not about you. And you may not like me for saying it, but it's true. So let's find out more about that. But before we do, let's bow our heads and our hearts. The Lord of Prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, as we come to your word, we come trusting in you. We come hungry for all that you have for us. We come anticipating your blessing. We come longing to sense the movement of the Holy Spirit among us and within us. For we know that your word is not just print on a page. It's not just a list of rules and do's and don'ts. It's not just histories. It's not just bedtime stories. Your word is living and active. And by your word, you make yourself known to us. So we pray that you would come, make yourself known, be present to us, and in the encounter, change us, mold us, and shape us according to your will. We do pray for the one who teaches, that you hide him behind the cross, so that in this time we might see Jesus and him only. For it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Tell you... Uh, tale about Ishmael. Ishmael uh, was a young man who went to a Muslim university. And while he was there, some other students in his dorm invited him to view the Jesus film with them. And so they went and they saw the Jesus film. And as they saw the truth about Christ, all of them were con convicted and became followers of Jesus Christ in a Muslim university. And they decided that they were hungry to know more about Christ. And so they formed a private student Bible study, despite the fact that they knew it could cost them their lives. Literally cost them their lives. But they continued to study. And after a while, Ishmael's brother, who went to that university, got wind of it. He told his father. His father immediately went to the university and drove Ishmael home, took him out of the university. And on the way home, his father made it known to his son that he had the right and the obligation to kill him because he had converted to Christianity. In that country, it is not unusual for Christians to be brutalized and even killed for their faith in Christ. And former Muslims, all the worse, because they've converted out of Islam. And so when they got home and his father began beating him, Ishmael fully, fully uh, had, had thought that he would be killed by his father. And so now mercifully his father decided not to exercise his right to kill his son. But after the beating, Ishmael asked his father if he could go before his whole family and explain to them what he had done. Somehow, amazingly, the father said yes. So they gathered the family, and Ishmael told them about his new, new faith in Christ and why he had decided to become a follower of Christ. And as a result of that, that presentation before his family, four more family members became followers of Jesus Christ. Now, we say praise God for that. But realize, for Ishmael's father, this was a problem. This was even greater shame than just having his son. Now his son was bringing other people out of their faith, and, and, and they were becoming followers of Christ. 
So what was he going to do? So he, he calls the town elders at this point and the extended family, and he calls together all the neighbors, and he calls the mullahs from the local mosque to all come and help him decide what he's going to do with his son. And Ishmael gets up in front of all this group, and he explains to them about his newfound commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what was the result of that final meeting, but I did hear that Ishmael's father was getting closer to becoming a believer himself. He allowed Ishmael to go back to university and even to attend the Bible study. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that cost of following Christ? That it might well cost you your life. And then to continue to hunger for more. Do you understand that kind of, of hunger to know more of God's Word? I'm, I'm afraid that we don't. We take it for granted. We've got Bibles that sit on our shelves. We've got Bible studies that happen in Sunday school classes that happen, and we go, eh, maybe someday. Not because it's any danger to us, not because it might cost us our lives, but because it might be inconvenient for us. It might cost us some time. And we might want to do something else with our time, and after all, we ought to do whatever makes us happiest at the moment, right? Because we're immersed in that culture that just is that culture of self. We're not willing to risk anything. We're, we're only willing to, to do what makes us feel good. You understand the kind of confidence in the Lord that, that's, that's required to have that kind of hunger. Do you acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Or do you simply give him lip service while you continue to, to roll down a path that just pursues whatever you like best? Now, I ask this question because it's a hard question for you and for me. Because we are so steeped in a culture of self-worship that, that we, we can't even realize it. We're just bombarded with it all the time. It's, it's hard to step back and to be able to, to objectively look at how is this culture affecting me? How am I buying into this culture in the way that I live? Jesus would ask us the question, what good is it for us to gain the whole world and yet lose ourselves or lose our, lose our soul? What are you trying to gain? Are you trying to gain Christ? Or are you simply keeping him as a, in a sidecar as you go along your own path? Can we say what Paul says in Philippians about, about putting our, our faith in Christ? Uh, uh, Paul was one of those who had position, he had influence, he had potential. But when he found Christ, he cast all that aside for the sake of following Christ. And he writes to the Philippian church saying, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, reasons to pursue worldly gain, he says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains for me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having the righteousness of my own that comes from my own, uh, uh, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Does those, those words sound a little familiar to you? We just sang it in that song, right? All I once held dear, I now count as loss. Because of knowing Christ, there is no greater thing. That's what, that's what Paul wrote about. That's what that, that song about, is, is about. But, but are we really seeking Christ in that way? Can we say with Paul, as he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Becoming like him in death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul understood what it was to lose self and, and, and make Christ all. He is our all in all. It's hard for us to assess how much our self-worshiping self culture has, has affected us. 
For instance, many in our culture nowadays don't get married. They live together. Why? Because they don't want to make a commitment to anybody but themselves. They want to make sure that all their options remain open. Something better comes along, I better keep it open. It's all about me, right? It becomes harder and harder if you've ever tried to plan an event to actually plan an event because nobody will commit to coming. People don't RSVP or make reservations nowadays. Why? Because it's all about me. And what if something better comes up at the last minute? What if I'm looking at my phone and somebody says, hey, you want to come over here instead? Well, I should leave that option up because it's all about me. Right? That's what our culture tells us. And we, we buy into it more and more. Whatever makes me happiest at the moment, that's what we're all about. In his book, Psychology as Religion, The Cult of Self-Worship, psychologist Paul Vitz wrote, Modern psychology has embraced narcissism and self-worship, or selfism. Selfism's fixation on personal rights has led to a citizenry who pledge allegiance not to family, church, or community, but to actualizing themselves. We all want the front of the bus the back of the church, and the center of attention. <laughs> and it's not just out there in the world either, it's the church itself too, because we, we bought into this in the consumer church. How do we choose a church? We choose it by what is going to be best for me, what do I want, what church is, is, is the biggest program, the best music, what church has all the affinity groups that, that I might enjoy, what church has uh, people my own age, what church is going to meet all my needs and, and have a pastor that's there at my beck and call. It's all about me when I choose a church. We, we've bought into the culture, hook, line, and sinker. We don't even recognize. The culture says that it's okay to just, just do your own thing. And so even as Christians, we have, we have mixed in what ought to be real Christianity with with anything else that comes along that just sounds good to us. And so we find people who go to church, and yet they'll also go to other faith traditions, uh, and, and they'll adopt their beliefs just because they think, oh, that sounds good, I guess I'll buy that too. You know, you know, when Paul talked about us growing to maturity so that we wouldn't be tossed back and forth by every wind of doctrine? Well, we are tossed back and forth by every wind and doctrine. Uh, many Christians believe in reincarnation, for instance. That's from Buddhism and Hinduism, but it has no place in Christianity. Uh, others uh, uh, practice yoga, not as a, you know, a, a, a bodily health thing, but as a spiritual practice. Uh, or, or those who will uh, buy into the, the whole idea that, that uh, there's spiritual energy in, in mountains and streams and crystals and astrology. These are the very things that God condemns in His Word. How can we, how can we put them together? The, the theological term is syncretism, that, and that we, we just adopt anything else along with whatever we thought was our faith. We have become a, a, a church that, that personalizes our faith much like we personalize our iPhones. Whatever program, whatever app we decide we like, we just put it on there. And so we have, we have created an idol that is in the form of ourselves, and we've called it Jesus. And the only way to avoid that is by His Word, by, by giving up ourselves and gaining Christ. You know, we think we have the best answers. But if we truly trust in Christ, we know that the best answers are to be found in Him and in Him only. You know, when we choose a church, it not, ought not to be about what's all about me. What is the presence and power of the Holy Spirit among that congregation and working in the lives of the people? Is the Word of God being faithfully taught in its fullness? Are people using, exercising their spiritual gifts to serve one another and serve the world? Are they outward focused? Do they have a passion for reaching the world for Jesus Christ? These are the things we ought to look for in churches. And then we ought to work at everything else. You know, we... We often look and say, well, that church doesn't have this or that, and I want this kind of thing in the church. Maybe it's because God is calling you to bring that to the church. Maybe God has put that on your heart because you have the ability to bring that to a church. 
And we really ought to be looking at what we bring to the church more than, than what the church will do for us. John Kennedy for the country had much to say that we ought to be applying to the church. Ask not what you ought to do for your church, but what your church ought to do for you. Well, now that's the opposite, right? That's what our culture would say. Ask not what you, your church can do for you, but what you can do for your church. Okay. I don't know how it was that John Kennedy had a worse New England accent than any New Englander I know. <laughs> we are called to give something to the church. I told you a few weeks ago about quotes from Joel Osteen. You all know who he is. He's become quite famous, church of tens of thousands in Texas. But he has actually come out and said that he will never say anything to make people feel uncomfortable. And then he went so far as to say that anyone who would tell you to deny yourself must be the devil. Well, if you read our scripture this morning, you realize it wasn't the devil, it was Jesus that said, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. And not just take up the discomfort of, of self-denial, but take up your cross, that implement of death, put yourself to death that you might gain Christ, that you might gain the world and lose self. That's what Jesus says. So we've got to choose whether we follow the Joel Osteen's or we follow the real deal in Jesus Christ. There's room on the throne of my life for one person and one person only. And when I make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, I put Christ on that throne. That's when I call Him Lord. You know, we're willing to take Him on as Savior you know, oh yeah, come on, save me. I'll put you in with the rest of the stuff on my iPhone. <clears throat> but we need to call him Lord. And when he is Lord, he is Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. There's room for one on the throne of my life. The problem that we have, and I point at you, but there's three fingers pointed back at me. Back at me. The problem that we have is that self continually wants to unseat Christ or try to share that throne. But there is only room for one on the throne of our lives. We forget that Jesus Christ has set us free from the slavery of self and sin and set us free to real life. That we have died to Christ and no longer live. The life I live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The struggle continues, doesn't it? struggle continues that, that we, we're just selfish by nature and we, we hold on to that. And Paul himself struggled with that, but wanting to do the right thing, but always struggling because find himself doing the wrong thing. And in his struggle, he was willing to be transparent enough, enough to be able to share and say, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that's subject to death? And then he gives the answer, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Bad news for you, it's not about you. But that's really good news. And the sooner that you realize that, the sooner you can let Christ dwell in you and live through you. The sooner you learn to deny yourself, the sooner you will find the life of joy that he calls you to. It is not all about you. And frankly, when it comes down to it, what a relief. That's a lot of pressure that it has to be all about me. We get so caught up in ourselves that we get stressed out, that we get depressed, and we become more and more inward focused. And, and psychology just feeds that frenzy. You know, we're, we're told, oh, you're depressed, we, you need to look deeper inside and find what's inside you that it, forget yourself. This, this is where we get, get caught up and, 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 and we have more and more problems because we just go deeper and deeper in ourselves and become more and more depressed. Get yourself, deny yourself, don't worry about yourself. Instead, focus on others. Do something for others and you'll find that your soul is being fed in the process. Paul tells us, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. It is when you lose yourself that you will find yourself. It is when you die to self that you will learn to live for Christ and find life. No one ever moved from bitter to better without losing the eye. Thomas Laments shares a little story from his boyhood 
that one day he was sitting in the living room listening to music and his father came in from shoveling snow and he said to him, Thomas, 24 hours from now, you won't remember what you were listening to. How about doing something in the next 20 minutes that you'll remember for the next 20 years? And I promise you, when you look back at it, it'll always make you happy. And Thomas said, well, what is it? He said, this is Brown's uh, sidewalks next door are covered in snow. Why don't you go see if you can clear them and get back home before she realizes you've done it? Well, Thomas went out and he did it in 15 minutes. And he shares his stories more than 20 years later to say that that thought still continues to bless him. When we lose ourselves for the sake of others, we find ourselves. But how do we give ourselves up, you say, if, if I don't look out for number one, who's going to do it? How will I, have, how will I maintain a sense of self-worth? Your self-worth doesn't come from you. It comes from another. Another who valued enough that he said, you are to die for. There is no price too great that I wouldn't pay to redeem you for a life. There is no price too high, not even my own life. And so he laid down his life for you that he might redeem you as his bride for eternity. That's your sense of self-worth. There is no greater worth than that, that the God of the universe, the God who made everything, the God who holds the stars in place, knows you by name. And he calls you to himself because he loves you. Jesus loves you. I know that sounds trite and cliche, but it doesn't when the Holy Spirit whispers it in your ear and makes it real. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you that you might have eternal life through faith in him. Jesus loves you. He has called you for his own. That's your self-worth. That is something that you can live in confidence out of so that you can take the focus off yourself. You don't have to prove yourself to anybody. You've already been proven in his great sacrifice for you that you can lose yourself and yet gain yourself. That you can let go of the throne of your life and let the one who really belongs there remain in the place that he has earned. Let me ask you this morning, who is on the throne of your life? Is it Christ? Are you still trying to share the throne with him? <clears throat> Have you surrendered that to him? What good is it to gain the whole world and yet lose yourself? But when we are willing to lose ourselves for him, we find that we have gained everything. Let's pray. Before I pray for you, I want to invite you to pray on your own. And ask the Lord to reveal to your heart if there are ways that you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Are there ways that you are still maintaining yourself? Or have you denied yourself? Are you following it? This morning, take a moment to simply say, Lord, I surrender to you. I trust you and I will follow you. Because I believe when I give up myself, that I gain everything in you. Give me a moment right now. Lord, as we prepare to come to your table of communion, that we are reminded of the great price that was paid for our redemption. Christ willingly went to the cross to take upon himself our sin and shame, to free us from the bondage of sin, that we might live for you. So, Lord, we pray that you would reveal to us ways that we hold on to ourselves and only hurt ourselves. <coughs> we might trust fully in you, that we might be fully surrendered to you. We might find the gain that can only be found when we lose ourselves. Take up our cross and follow you. Pray these things in Jesus' precious name.